Um, the sermon is taken from three sermons, one called Daring Greatly, um, and they were all done in either 2013 or 2015. In 2010, Brene Brown's talk on the power of vulnerability was a runaway hit and became one of the most viewed TED Talks of all time, with more than 9 million views to date. Brene Brown has a master's degree and doctorate in social work and is a researcher who studies people's stories. She explains the trajectory of her research this way. I wanted to develop research that explained the anatomy of connection. Connection is why we're here. We are hardwired to connect with others. It's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives, and without it, there is suffering. She continues, studying connection was a simple idea, but before I knew it, I had been hijacked by, by my research participants who, when asked to talk about their most important relationships and experiences of connection, kept telling me about their heartbreak, betrayal, and shame. The fear of not being worthy of real connection. She defines shame as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. The course of Brown's research led her to focus on studying shame. She wanted to learn about, sh about how shame operates as a barrier to connection, but she found out that it was difficult to come at shame so directly with her research subjects. So she turned the topic on its head and asked a different question. What do the people who are the most resilient to shame, who believe in their own worthiness, she calls these people the wholehearted, what do they have in common? As it turned out, in her research of wholehearted people who live lives of courage, <laughs> compassion, and connection, she found a common trait that they all shared. The, willing, the willingness to be vulnerable emerged as the single clearest value shared by all of the women and men whom I would describe as wholehearted. They attribute everything, from their professional success to their marriages to their proudest parenting moments to their ability to be vulnerable. She says this, in order to have a more abundant life, what we need is to put ourselves out there, show up, engage with life and with others. In other words, be vulnerable. What is vulnerability? It means going beyond our comfort zones, taking an emotional risk, doing or saying what our soul calls us to do. It means acting without certainty of success, choosing to try what is worth trying even if we might fail. To be alive is to be vulnerable. Madeline LeAngle writes, when we were children, we used to think that when we were grown up, we would no longer be vulnerable. But to grow up is to accept vulnerability. Our efforts to shield ourselves from vulnerability only make us weaker and more lonely. Performers make themselves vulnerable, like Leanne just did, thank you. <laughs> Anyone who puts themselves in front of others and has something to offer takes a risk. An older friend is a well-known and popular preacher in our denomination. In his early years of ministry, he met the singer Sammy Davis Jr. These two talented men found many similarities in their experiences of connecting with an audience and a congregation. Among other traits in common, they revealed to each other that they both got upset stomachs before going on. My friend avoided breakfast every Sunday. Sammy Davis Jr. said he threw up every concert. Vulnerability is not for celebrities only. It's a part of ordinary life. Here are some examples of how we show it. Expressing disagreement, asking for help, traveling, going on a date, asking someone out on a date, starting a business, cooking dinner for others, creating art, introducing yourself and greeting a person that you don't know, playing a competitive sport, trying out something new, going home for the holidays, standing on the street corner asking for spare change or food, taking a lesson or a class, giving a gift and watching as the person opens it. And just think to yourself some other ones that you can think of right now. This part of the sermon is by Roger Jones. Um, a, an associate minister in Sacramento, California. For the past three semesters, I have spent one day a week at Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley. 
I'm in a doctor of ministry program there. This semester, I've joined the chapel choir. I've sung before in community and church choirs. Let me tell you, it's always out of my comfort zone. I feel out of place, ready to be excused at any moment. I'm not a trained singer. I don't read music. I can carry a tune if I have a strong tenor or two near me. I thank them profusely for letting me stand next to them. I praise them. What I want to say is, please help. Please don't shun me. <laughs> for last week's chapel, we learned for four songs fast. As the director rehearsed us through a tricky line, I opened my eyes wide, eyebrows arched. Yes, she said, looking at me. Have a question? No, I said, just listening. I could have said no, just scared. <laughs> In spite of the discomfort of choir practice, I'm learning things there and getting ideas for services back here. It's fun, even if not the kind of relaxed fun I have watching a play or a dance performance where other people are making themselves vulnerable. Brene Brown writes about the results of her research. Every single person I interviewed spoke about struggling with vulnerability. It's not as if there are lucky people among us who can openly embrace vulnerability without reservation, hesitation, or fear. Brene Brown asked people what situations they could think of. Losing a job, waiting for a biopsy to come back, calling a friend whose child has died, exercising out of doors when you're not feeling great about your body, admitting, I'm afraid, accepting accountability, asking for forgiveness, having faith. Brown wants to be clear what vulnerability is not. It is not weakness. On the contrary, to take a risk is to show courage. Brown wants to make clear vulnerability is not letting it all hang out. It's not oversharing, Brown says. Vulnerability is about sharing our feelings and ideas with people who have earned the right to hear them. We don't bear our souls the first time we meet someone. Boundaries are important. Taking time to develop trust is important. important. Of course, there's no guarantee when we eventually do dare to stretch ourselves. There's never a guarantee. Brown says it's a chicken or egg issue. We need to feel trust in order to feel vulnerable, and we need to be vulnerable in order to trust. In families, communities, congregations, relationships, it's a slow process that happens over time. One of the reasons we have, written, have a written covenant in this congregation is that we have a baseline, a guidepost. We can see how we agree to be here with one another and for one another. Attending any worship service is, as a newcomer is an exercise in vulnerability. Often what brings people to seek out a spiritual community is facing a personal challenge or a transition in life. We all feel vul vulnerable in transitions. We're stepping on a new path, having to learn or do new things, feeling uncertain. So the choice to check out a congregation is a brave choice. We bring with us seeds, needs, needs and gifts, but we don't know if our gifts will be welcome or our needs validated. We don't know if our expectations are unrealistic and we will be disappointed. We don't know if we will fall in love with a group of people or feel like an outsider. Will we encounter frustration or stretch ourselves and grow beyond our wildest expectations? And it's, a, it's an adventure to show up as a newcomer and every adventure is about vulnerability. Brown asked the question, how does vulnerability feel? Some responses she got is taking off the mask and hoping the real me isn't too disappointing. It's where courage and fear meet. The root of the word vulnerable means capable of being wounded. So of course it can feel frightening, a lump in the throat, sweaty palms like mine are right now, <laughs> shaky hand, shallow breathing. It looks cool only in the movies. One person said it feels like going out on a limb, a very high limb others letting go of control, taking off a straitjacket. One said, it feels so awkward and scary, but it makes me human and alive. All this has to do with engaging with life, connecting with others. We human beings are hardwired for connection, Brown says. Connecting is risky, but when we avoid it, we disengage. We give up what makes us human and what, what helps us to grow and thrive. She admits, of course, we are totally exposed when we are vulnerable. 
This is why vulnerability is the first thing we look for in others and the last thing we want to show to others. Let's take the time to notice when we feel a harsh rush to judgment toward another. Do we want to lash out, want to run away, want to punish? Brown says the urge to blame or shame another is a way to distract scrutiny from our own vulnerability, a sense of weakness or shame, a protection mechanism. Let's pause to examine our own discomfort. Let's be gentle with ourselves and with others. Now we have a video clip that's embedded in one of the other sermons on blame. So bear with us as we get the sound right. This is about blame. How many of you are blamers? How many of you, when something goes wrong, the first thing you want to know is whose fault it is? Hi, my name is Brene. I'm a blamer. <laughs> Let me just tell you this quick story. So this is a couple of years ago when I first realized the magnitude to which I blame. I'm on white slacks and a pink sweater set, and I'm drinking a cup of coffee in my kitchen. It's a full cup of coffee. I drop it on the tile floor. It goes into a million pieces, splashes up all over me. And the first, I mean, a millisecond after it hit the floor, right out of my mouth is this. Damn you, Steve. <laughs> Who's my husband? Because let me tell you how fast this works for me. So Steve plays water polo with a group of friends. And the night before, he went to go play water polo. And I said, hey, make sure you come back at 10, because you know, I can never fall asleep into your home. And he got back like at 10.30. And so I went to bed a little bit later than I thought. Ergo, my second cup of coffee that I probably would not be having had he come home when we discussed. <laughs> Therefore, and so the rest of the story is I'm cleaning up um, the kitchen. Steve calls, caller ID. I'm like, hey. He's like, hey, what's going on, babe? What's going on? Um, so I'll tell you exactly what's going on. I'm cleaning up the coffee that spilled all, like dial tone. Because he knows. How many of you go to that place when something bad happens, the first thing you want to know is whose fault is it? I'd rather it be my fault than no one's fault. Because why? Why? Because it gives us some semblance of control. But here, if you enjoy blaming, this is where you should stick your fingers in your ear and do the no, 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 no thing because I'm getting ready to ruin it for you. Because here's what we know from the research. Blame is simply the discharging of discomfort and pain. It has an inverse relationship with accountability. Accountability, by definition, is a vulnerable process. It means me calling you and saying, hey, my feelings were really hurt about this, and talking. It's not blaming. Blaming is simply a way that we discharge anger. People who blame a lot seldom have the tenacity and grit to actually hold people accountable because we expend all of our energy raging for 15 seconds and figuring out whose fault something is. And blaming is very corrosive in relationships, and it's one of the reasons we miss our opportunities for empathy. Because when something happens and we're hearing a story, we're not really listening. We're in the place where I was, making the connections as quickly as we can about whose fault something was. So that was Brene's voice on uh, blame, and that's just an example of how we can ex start examining ourselves and our responses to things. Um, so, parenting. It looks to me like courage. To parent a child is to expose yourself to doubt, uncertainty, and making mistakes. A parent struggling to respond calmly to a child's inconsolable screaming or disobedient mischief may not feel strong and brave in the moment, but to an observer, the courage is evident. On Friday, a friend who has nine-year-old twins posted this on Facebook. Truly, sometimes trying to herd two nine-year-old humans out of the house in the morning involves a, new, a level of patience and mindfulness that I have yet to cultivate, and I am humbled. Even the feeling of joy involves emotional exposure. We can feel joy and then feel dread that it won't last or that the rug will be pulled out from under us. In moments of joy, all of us can feel the uncomfortable quake of vulnerability, as Brown says. 
She calls this joy a foreboding joy. We dare not be too happy lest we be disappointed. We dare not love this person, this child, this job, lest we lose it. We dare not love this new president lest he or she let us down. This was written in 2013. <laughs> um, Brown says we must be daring, be open to the joy. And she prescribes a research-proven antidote to the foreboding and shielding from our joy. It's not a pill, but a practice, the practice of gratitude. In the research she has conducted, gratitude was highly correlated with the experience of joy, and not just the idea of gratitude, not merely having an attitude of gratitude. People had specific practices, such as keeping gratitude journals and gratitude jars, or implementing family rituals. I have one. In the mornings, I begin my prayers and meditation with gratitude for specific things, and I mention them. In my personal household, my husband is, um, and I have introduced an appreciation circle. So every night at dinner, we go around the circle, and each one of us identifies something we appreciate about members of our family. Some days, I am not in a good mood, but still I try to pause to give thanks. Other days, I'm in the groove, and it seems easy. I feel pretty lucky, healthy, employed, only minor aches. Yet when I'm sick, I get whiny and feel sorry for myself. So how will I handle any big health challenge down the road? I don't know. This is why I practice gratitude now. It's my inoculation against foreboding and worry. Gratitude is my multivitamin for keeping an open heart when times are tough. Brown has spoken to people with sad stories, parents who've lost a child, survivors of genocide, lots of hardship. And those who find purpose and joy in life claim that gratitude is what works. It keeps away despair and resentment. Practice gratitude. Practice vulnerability. Each time I try something new or muster up my courage to have a difficult conversation, a friend tells me, that's money in the bank. It's as if every step of daring is an investment of courage for future steps. Money in the bank. It's a building up of confidence and worth. What's more, our expressions of courage have a multiplier effect. To others, what feels like vulnerability to us looks like courage. We spread courage around, encourage others, just by showing up and being vulnerable. Brown says, vulnerability is the path to connection and growth, and courage is the light that helps us travel that path. Credit yourself for your courage. Give thanks for your courage. Brene Brown asks, what are the things worth doing so much that it's worth attempting them even if you fail? This is what it means to dare greatly. Brown writes of her own struggle to be vulnerable. Try new things, take more chances, and set new boundaries. She counts on the supports of her spouse, close friends, and a therapist. As a mother, she says, I want our home to be a place where we can be our bravest selves and our most fearful selves where we practice difficult conversations and share our shaming moments from school and work, and when we fail, we'll fail together while daring greatly. This is what I envision for our congregation. I want us to make a place where we can be our bravest selves and our most fearful selves. I want this to be a place where we practice difficult conversations, share moments of risking and failing, and when we fail, fail together while daring greatly. There are plenty of times when we all choose protection over engagement, when we, when we stay in our comfort zones. I am trying to take notice of my own protective devices and my moments of shrinking back rather than stretching myself, not condemning, just noticing. I'm reminding myself I am enough. I'm trying to take steps worth taking, risking to, to be my biggest, best self. I'm asking friends to pray for me, listen to me, and support me. I'm taking notice when I make even small movements out of my comfort zone and I'm giving thanks for being vulnerable. So I invite you, notice when you're going to make yourself emotionally vulnerable. Give yourself credit. Plan how you will support yourself. Ask for support from others. Remind yourself that you are enough. Choose to take a step, not a step that is guaranteed or certain to succeed, but a step in the right direction, a step that's worth taking even if it does not work out. 
Reflect on those moments when you have put yourself in an uncertain situation, risked your sense of protection, stretched your comfort zone. Reflect on this weekly or daily. Give yourself credit for being vulnerable. Give yourself credit for engaging with life, for your daring. Ask yourself it if it was a brave thing to do. Give thanks for trying. I thank you for your courage. This is what we can do for one another. In community, we can do this. With kindness to ourselves and mutual support with others, let us dare to show up in our vulnerability and our courage and our beauty. Let us speak and act as our values call us to act. Let us live as deep in our souls we long to live. So may it be, blessed be.